for quite some time now, haven't you? Yes. 30, tell us how many? 37 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> and tell us how you got started and, and um, if you've ever done any other kind of law other than criminal. Nope, never done anything but this. And I was thinking back on it about growing up in the 50s and 60s and all of the terminal but things that were going on at that time really had a big effect on me. Um, you know, living in Austin, uh, we had the, we followed the Jack Ruby trial intently when our president had been killed in 63 and then in 66, Charles Whitman went up to the tower in Austin where I lived and was one of the first mass shootings. These things were just integrated into my life because my dad was the district attorney at the time and also in the military. Um, his story about the tower shooting was flying in on an airplane as it's going on and they're calling him saying because he's a colonel in the National Guard they wanted to go to Camp Mabry and get some huge bazooka to blow up the top of the tower um, <laughs> and he knew that the police were trying to get up there and who all that that would could possibly injure and he talked them out of blowing up the top of the tower um, and so these were things that were just um, amazing to watch in my life as I was growing up because I saw the incredible pressure put on him to indict Charles Whitman's psychiatrist because he had told the psychiatrist that he was going to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, just watching that play out in the news and the media and the pressure uh, and seeing that that never happened um, gave me a great feel for this area that he was in. Um, because not only did he do all of that, but he was also a um, Baptist deacon. And so all of his, besides being a war hero, which I think gave him another perspective of what all we do, uh, having served in World War II, um, he also preached um, that we will be judged by how we treat the least among us. And it was something that, to me, just led me into this field because we represent so many hopeless and helpless, and um, they need somebody to give them a handout. When I was young, I worked in Roy Minton's office one summer. That was an eye-opener to uh, work in his office, and I went into the back room, and he had the South Texas Miranda rights, and I you know had been getting ready to go to law school and study in Miranda, and the South Texas Miranda rights were you have the absolute right to remain silent as long as you can stand the pain. And so it was a clear thing to me that we were coming out of that period in the 50s and 60s where beating confessions was just acceptable. Um, and we were moving into a much better and brighter future, but we needed lawyers to stand up for those uh, who couldn't stand up for themselves. And uh, I immediately went into criminal defense and it's been the best decision I've ever made. <laughs> and you never were a prosecutor? Were I was never a prosecutor. Um, uh, and I, though I have tremendous respect for what they do, they have a difficult job. Um, my dad was um, and then became a judge for many years and um, he always talked about um, the that it was a great trial experience if you were a prosecutor. Um, he talked to me about uh, the experience of his military. One summer, I remember, you know, he did not believe that summer's off for his kids. And we were painting the house. Um, and uh, that was our summer job, was to paint the house. And I'm on a ladder under the overhang, painting the overhang, and we had an undercoat, and then we had an overcoat. And he's stomping around the yard so mad because he can't find his crowbar. His crowbar's missing. Where's his crowbar? Who's moved his crowbar? And about the time that he goes off, I get down from that ladder and I see that crowbar up on the roof. And I have painted it. 
not once, but twice. And I thought, for sure, this old man's head, he that big old bald head, was just going to turn bright red and explode when I presented him this crowbar that had been painted twice. And he looked at me and he said, oh, honey, you would have made the best foot soldier. You know the rule in the Army is if it doesn't move, you paint it. If it moves, you salute it. <laughs> and so it kind of gave me sort of my feeling about how I ended up doing what I do is I'm, I'm a foot soldier. You know, I go out there. I love to do stuff for TCDLA. I love to get involved in doing different projects. And that's because I'm a foot soldier, and I'm proud of it. Although you're a former president, aren't you? Yes, again, because I showed up. <laughs> and I do have to say um, about TCDLA, you know, they were always so opening. And again, another Roy Minton story. I'm, I'm in his office, and he's so fatherly to me. He, he was like another father to me. And his kids were always in and out of that office. His kids meant the whole world to him. Um, but he took me under his wing and said, honey, 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 you need to work in my office because you have the most amazing ability to get along with a house full of bitches. You know, this is the way he would refer to his own office. And then he said, and I know you want to go to law school, but, but honey, nobody is going to hire a woman lawyer. And I appreciated that. And I do what my husband says I do that is so much like my dad. I smile and nod my head and I go do what I intended to do anyway. <laughs> um, and I went to law school and was welcomed by TCDLA um, with open arms. Uh, civil firms were not hiring women. They were getting sued over not hiring women when I graduated. And so um, it was wonderful to meet TCDLA. And somebody resigned from the board and they asked me to fill in. For my first board meeting, I was so excited because I'd seen Weldon Holcomb up there. And for those that don't know, he's passed away. He was a Baptist minister, and he was the welcome. He was he there in cow yes, mm -hmm. cowboy hat and boots from Longview, saying, welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, brother. Come in to the meeting. It was just so welcoming and seeing it. And he always had a pocket full of candy that he's passing out. And so I walk up to my first board meeting and he said, oh, welcome, sister. The wives are meeting next door. <laughs> and I had to tell Mr. Holcomb, I said, Mr. Holcomb, I'm actually on the board. And he got the biggest smile. Oh, my God. Well, welcome, sister. We're glad to have you. Have some candy. Come into your board meeting. So I have to say, of the things that I've seen changed, it's the incredible impact that women have on TCDLA and the huge change uh, by having women involved in our organization. And how else have you seen the practice change in your career? Well, um, I would say um, that um, when I started, um, anybody could, if you had a pulse, you could walk over and put your name on the court point of this. Mm -hmm. They were begging for people. And at the time that I started, our jail <clears throat> was uh, condemned, but we still had it open at the top of the courthouse, sitting on top of the courthouse. Had an old elevator that they had to have an operator to run because you guess the doors closed and he cranked you up to the top of the courthouse and you got out. Uh, and some very wise lawyers had told me, you know, be sure and let the client go in that tiny little room first because that's really where all the water is going to drip down from the ceiling and we hope to God it's water. Um, and your back's to the door in case you need an exit. Yeah. And so um, I'm in one of those and we had two judges, Judge Thurman and Judge Blackwell. And because I was on the appointment list, all, and my dad um, was one of the judges, I all of my cases went to Judge Thurman. And um, those of us that knew, you really wanted Judge Blackwell. But Judge Thurman was a dear friend of mine, and he taught me a lot. And I'm walking in to tell this court appointed client for the first time, you know, you've been assigned to Judge Thurman. And I'm kind of anxious about what he's going to say. And he goes, oh, thank God, that Judge Blackwell sends his own kids to prison. <laughs> and I'm just, 
oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you're happy. Um, and so um, I got to try a lot of cases. I got to uh, be with a lot of really good lawyers. And now I think it's, a, it's more difficult. You know, we have um, implemented more standards for court-appointed attorneys, and so a lot of times it is really, really difficult uh, for young lawyers to get that trial experience. So I tell them, please volunteer, please go watch these great lawyers. Anytime I got a chance to hear Racehorse or Horn Burnett speak, uh, I read a whole book about Clarence Darrow was just the most amazing lawyer. Uh, final arguments that went for days, you know, just amazing. And, and of course, Percy Bowman. My dad adored Percy Bowman. Thought the world revolved around Percy Bowman. Um, but that's what young lawyers can do, and that's really different, I think, uh -huh. um, uh, with young lawyers. And what other advice would you give to somebody we often call them baby lawyers, but for those just beginning uh, their career out of law school. Well, what I tell people is that if you want to do this, you really need to just have a basic caring about people. Um, again, I go back to my upbringing and my dad's prayers were always keep us ever mindful of the needs of others and teach us to love mercy, do justice and walk humbly with God. And you hear that every night at dinner. It means something to you. And so you have to go into this because you care about people. If you're going into this to make money, all I can hear is Racehorse Haynes saying, you have made a serious miscalculation of judgment. <laughs> and I think of Doug Tinker and him talking to one of his clients mid-trial that was not going well, and he turns to him and says, you need to expedite your plans for escape. <laughs> and that's what you need to do is get out of the criminal field if you think it's the one that you're, you want to make money. Mm -hmm. You have to care about people. You have to care about their lives. You have to care about what happens to them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you've been pretty involved with the state bar for many years, haven't you? Yes. And what, what, uh, I was on the been to you? Commission for Lawyer Discipline, again, because somebody from TCDLA picked up the phone and called me on a Friday afternoon. Yes, I'm in the office on Friday afternoon. I learned very uh, young, early lawyer. My clients get paid on Friday. They will not have it on Saturday. So if you want your money, you better be in the office on Friday afternoon. So I'm there Friday afternoon, get a call from TC, TCDLA member saying, the Commission for Lawyer Discipline needs a criminal lawyer. They don't have any criminal lawyers. It's been forever since they've had a criminal lawyer. I don't even know what it is. And I'm like, okay, yes, sir. You want me to do that again? My foot soldier, you know, um, I'll do it. And it turned out it runs the entire grievance citizen for the entire state of Texas. And shortly after being named to it, the, uh, the chair resigned, and so they made me chair for five years. And I do get to tell a good story about Catherine Shelton. Um, because she is no longer a lawyer, and all of this is public information, but mm -hmm. so much of the grievance is private. Um, but she was kind of a notorious lawyer in Houston mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. um, suspected of a paramour disappearing, believing to be dead, that they couldn't figure out what happened to him. And so when some reporter came to talk to her about it, um, she shot him, mm -hmm. went to prison, mm -hmm. um, got out of prison, and was still practicing law and uh, went to Dallas, moved to Dallas, mm -hmm. started some kind of immigration lawyer, and had a fallen out with her secretary and her husband. The secretary gets shot, the husband gets killed, and of course the focus turns to Miss Skelton, um, and they eventually convict her husband of the murder. And so A&E has this whole program about Catherine Skelton and all these different horrific things that have happened and the tagline at the end was always, um, and she's still practicing law in the state of Texas. Uh, we had her on a three-year probation <clears throat> and she'd gotten found in contempt several times during the time she was on probation. And so we had a public motion to revoke her probation, which would revoke her bar license in front of Judge Deeds in Dallas. 
and we've got all the judges that she had been found in contempt of and all the different rule violations that she'd been involved in. And so Miss Skelton gets up there on the witness stand to testify in her own behalf about why Judge Dietz should not revoke her bar license. And she's talking about being sick and all kinds of problems. And, you know, we've been very careful about not bringing up any of this past history. We're just limited it to the contempt that she was found in um, for her probation. And Judge Dietz turns to her and he says, Miss Skelton, have you ever thought of doing something else besides practicing law? And I swear to you, she pulled one of our clients. She turned and looked at me and she said, Judge, yes, but every time I apply for a job, they Google me and all those murders show up. I swear to God, she said that in open court. A lawyer who you would have thought had known better. That we, and, and Dietz kind of had this sort of like light bulb go off. Oh, oh, you're that Catherine Shelton. <laughs> So she got her bar, lost her bar license during the time that she's suspended. You know, at the end of a suspension, you need to get your license back. Right. During the time that she was suspended, she shoplifts some expensive purse out of a store and gets convicted, and that's an automatic disbarment. So we finally disbarred Miss Skelton over shoplifting, and the A&E program had to change their version <laughs> of what happened to Catherine Skelton. But it just was uh, important. I uh -huh. enjoyed it. I enjoyed the other side of it, which was letting a bunch of silk stocking lawyers know what the real practice of law is. And that, yes, there are lots of lawyers in this field who have disgruntled clients. Nobody wants to be in prison. No. And when you're in prison, you have lots of time to think about things your lawyer did. Mm -hmm. And this was really important to, to make the civil bar aware. And I think that's why it was so important to have a criminal lawyer involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. So I, I was happy to do it. And do you have special cases, Betty, that, that are memorable to you? I do. Um, it's more uh, Trooper Wet Spot, uh, more of uh, police officers that are memorable in this case. We had sort of a notorious officer in Austin um, that Stuart Kiner did some incredible work on to find that he basically was just copying his probable cause affidavit and every single one of them the person had a wet spot. And in Stewart's case, he had a video of the person. You could clearly see there was no wet spot. So that further proved that this guy was just um, had a copy. M my case, um, he had the client's car and description and everything all wrong. And so I'm, I'm and I had looked into his background and found out that he'd been um, selling steroids to his other troopers. And when you saw him, you knew it. I mean, he was enormous from the waist up. Um, and so we had, um, Stewart actually had an entire hearing in front of Judge Aguilar, who's one of our judges that has passed away, on just whether this guy was credible. And filled the courtroom was filled with troopers. And Stewart and I and Judge Aguilar, uh, he and he did the most incredible job, and the judge did the right thing and said he was not, um, so that we were able to get rid of a trooper who liked to tell everyone that would listen that he had the highest number of DWI arrests um, in the state of Texas, and so it was it was it was a good day justice. It was a good day for justice. But one of my first trials that I had, uh, since I told you my dad's prayer, um, was a, a resistant arrest. And um, my client had gotten into being mouthy in a bar with a cop, and so they broke his leg. And since they broke his leg, we got to file something on him, right? So they filed resistant arrest. And that was the most fun trial I had ever had. Um, by, uh, and remember arguing, being able to use my dad's prayer, talking about how if my client had just been a little more humble um, and kept his mouth shut, we wouldn't be here. 
if the cops had had a little mercy, we wouldn't have been here. And now I was asking this jury to do justice. And it was a five minute not guilty. It was the most fun I've ever had. And absolutely, you know, just yeah. the height of fun. <laughs> And were you a soul practitioner in those days? Yes, yes, always. Um, loved, loved it. Um, I have office with different lawyers at different times, um, but I found that I really, really like being by myself because um, I could be in control. I'm a control mm -hmm. freak about making sure that I'm on top of everything. And, um, you know, I guess that's. Um, one of the things that has caused me to become so involved in the Capital Area Private Defender Service, um, which is my thing that I think of all the years I've done that I'm really the most proud about, mm -hmm. is because having seen over the years change where um, we have so many lawyers wanting to do court appointments that we really don't want those lawyers that only want to do the court appointments for money because the money's terrible. So that means that you're really not wanting to do this at all, but this is a way to get a little bit of money. That we really do want those young people that care um, and care about their clients. And so we worked really hard to create this new system where we basically wrestled it away from the judges, created a nonprofit uh, where we decide who gets to be on the court. And we, meaning the Austin Criminal Defense Lawyers Association and the Austin Bar Association, created a nonprofit that we get to decide through the review committee that you serve on that um, what level they are, whether they're qualified. We have for the first time a grievance system where when families just cannot get in touch with a court appointed lawyer, do yeah. not feel like they're doing anything, we have some place to send these. We have an executive director to try to counsel that lawyer, try to help that lawyer, try to get something done. And if they don't, there is some consequence that you guys on the review committee can remove them, um, which has never been done under the judges, ever been done under the judges. Um, and so, so important to really try to raise that bar um, because you talk about being judged how we treat the least. Those that are in the jail charged right. with the most serious crimes have really got to have the better lawyers. And so I'm really proud of Austin that we created this system to mm -hmm. fix our court appointed system so that we could make sure that we're trying to do the right thing. Sure, sure. Have you ever been involved in, in uh, lobbying? I know you're yes. just a few blocks from the from the Capitol. Yes. That's the other thing I tell young lawyers. If you want to get involved, you can volunteer. I volunteered um, because, uh, because of being so close. Dave Shepard and Jerry Morse uh, were on the um, lobbying committee for TCL. It was all volunteered. Mm -hmm. um, and they took me out to dinner one night and said, would you be the chair? <laughs> and I was stupid enough to say yes. <laughs> Good for children. But I loved it. During that time, MAD was very powerful. They were changed, as I tell people. The time I started, we couldn't find your DWI the conviction that you had 30 miles from here. It just, people would get 10, 15, 20 DWIs. Mm -hmm. um, there were notoriously famous people yeah. with 20 DWIs in um, Travis County. Uh, Wilbur Thorpe was a guy that would appear in my dad's court, and he had been an important witness on a big murder case, mm -hmm. and his court-appointed attorney could never figure out why Judge Blackwell was never sending Wilbur Thor Thorpe to prison <laughs> for his <laughs> next DWI. Um, he would get all kinds of county time, which you could do on felonies back then, mm -hmm. um, but he never was sent to prison. Um, but so MAD was very powerful, and they changed the laws, and they made the recording of all of these, and elimination of deferred adjudication for DWIs, uh, enhancements for DWIs, and ALR, also. ALR, where they cease license. Um, we talked about that for 10 years, we fought that. Uh, it took them 10 years before they could actually seize driver's licenses, mm -hmm. and it was because Phil Glam came down and they made it Senate Bill 1. And if you know how it works, the most important bills are the low number ones and Senate Bill 1 passed. Um, but I do have to say 
that we did some great stuff on that. We got in live, uh, in person live hearings where we could subpoena people, mm -hmm. um, which they did not want at all. They right. wanted paper hearings for driver's license hearings. Um, and uh, my other big claim to fame is that MAD still doesn't have their number one desire, which is roadblocks in the state of Texas. <laughs> but my favorite about that was one year I was doing the legislative update, and Stuart Kiner was introducing me. And he introduced me and he said, the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers have made this pronouncement. They are changing their name. They are now MAD, the Mothers Against Betty Blackwell. <laughs> <laughs> because she shows up and she gives them such trouble at the legislature. Uh, and that made me feel very good sure, for all sure. those meetings and hours and hours and hours of volunteer time of getting just beaten up um, by man to, to have somebody recognize that. I certainly appreciated it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> great. That's a great one. Mm. What haven't I asked you, Betty, that you would like people to remember or know about? I think um, I haven't really explained how the effect of women on this organization and on juries mm -hmm. and on the court system. Um, I think there's a funny case with you and I where um, there were just so few women in the Travis County Courthouse and so few women in the um, uh, criminal justice system and so I'm either get ready to try a case or help another lawyer try a case. And the next thing I know, I look over and it had always been all the white male district attorneys on the other side and in walks Jeanette Kiner. <laughs> because it was such a recognition that women are so powerful with juries. Um, that they, even the DA's office went, oh my God, well, the defense has got a woman, we've got to have a woman. <laughs> and uh, one of my very first hired clients, um, Travis County was very big in promoting women judges and women prosecutors and women bailiffs and women, and uh, we, I took care of his case in front of Judge Brenda Kennedy and everybody in her court was a woman. Um, and at this point, I just didn't even notice it. We turn around and walk out, my guy's a little elderly guy, and he said, well, Miss Blackwood, I just have to tell you, with all those women in the courtroom, I was so glad my wife talked me into hiring a woman lawyer. <laughs> uh, and it is, we've had a tremendous effect, I think, okay. um, of kicking down those doors and opening up that courthouse um, to women over the time period from when I started, right, and they didn't want to hire us, yeah, uh, to sure. now where they desperately need us, uh, right. because we bring credibility, honesty, and uh, so such a different Perspective, and now the juries we have so mm -hmm. many women, so it makes a huge, huge difference. Um, sometimes I'm embarrassed a little bit about how many things I've been able to do, um, and it reminds me of uh, when Martha Dickey talked about being asked to serve as state mm -hmm. bar sure. president. She looked at me and she said, "Well, Betty, between us, you know, they just needed a girl." <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes. <laughs> I feel like that that's, uh, I'm a little embarrassed about it, yeah. but I have, uh, I have loved being a foot soldier for TCDMI. It has made my life so full, and I have had so many experiences that I would not have had, but for being a girl that showed up sure. uh, and being there. So. Well, you've been invaluable to TCDMI, and I'm glad you're finally getting the recognition you deserve. Oh, I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. You're welcome.